Okay, so um, I'm Lisa Cahill. I teach in the theology department here. And I have to say two things just for openers. One is thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this. And the, the surveys and the data are just extremely interesting. So I read everything avidly and I've tried to compute it all. But the second thing that I want to say is I'm a theologian and not a social scientist. And so I uh, have certain interpretations of the data or hypotheses, and I'm sure in many cases I'm missing important points or construing something incorrectly. So you'll have to, uh, uh, you know, we'll watch. correct that <laughs> in the discussion. Okay. So um, as I just said, I'm a theologian. I'm also a social ethicist. And so one thing that social ethicists think, it's a bias we have, is that there's no such thing as value-free social science. Right. So I'm reading this, and there's like a hypothesis in here, in all of these essays that were in the NCR especially, and then this morning too, that seems to come through to me. So I'm, I'm acknowledging that I'm inferring this. This is not something you said directly. But the, the impression that I get from these surveys is that you have... Um, your, your, one of your goals, or your main goal, is really to show that there are still a lot of committed Roman Catholics who value the sacraments, believe basic teachings, affirm the key nature of helping the poor, but make their own autonomous decisions on sex and gender issues, and they don't pay much attention to the bishop's authority to say otherwise. And there's a further inference that one could make that would go even further than that sort of descriptive uh, characterization. And it would be that the sense of the faithful is against the bishops on sex and gender issues and shows they need to change. So that's what I draw from reading the whole thing and listening to the presentations. Now, I do not disagree with those implicit hypotheses. In fact, I agree to a huge amount. Um, and yet, at the same time, I want to uh, first appreciate, but then also problematize some of the data and interpretations, and then raise a couple further questions about what we could look at in the future. So um, it's not that I'm disagreeing with your social science data because I don't have the expertise to do that. It all sounded perfectly credible to me. So um, I'm taking it at face value and assuming that it's all accurate. So what I have to say is just based on that. And I, I'll, I have five basic points that I'll just uh, capture very quickly for you and then go over them uh, more one by one. And the first thing is um, to ask what we mean by autonomy, okay? Um, we say that Catholics are autonomous decision makers, but are they really, or what else are they paying attention to if it's not the bishops? The second thing is um, about the significance of the vast disagreement on sexual ethics issues. And the, again, sort of linking to the first question, what are Catholics really listening to? It's not so much that they're just autonomous, it's they're, that they're listening to an alternative culture, which can have not only good, but also bad implications. A third thing is, and this is dear to my heart as a Catholic social ethicist, they say they're helping the poor, but are they really? And is that the way they're voting? So uh, just to disclose something here, I was on Obama's Catholic advisory committee in 2008, and one thing that we were watching very closely was the effect of Catholic social teaching on the voters and to get the common good message out there. Uh, and yet, when the polling data appeared, the Pew Forum provided some of it, it was far from clear that that's why Catholics chose Obama. Uh, and in fact, it was the Hispanic Catholics that chose Obama. So, so it's very complicated. You know, they say things, and what do they actually do? Um, and then the two further questions for uh, just discussion would be, first, what are younger Catholics looking for? So millennial Catholics. So those who, they and the younger cohorts would be the future of the church. And what do they really want out of religious identity and religious faith? And then the final thing would be, what are the future roles of Catholic education in view of the values and circumstances of the millennial generation and younger? And I don't really know the answer to that, but I'll just open some things out. 
Okay, so first of all, on the issue of autonomy and the autonomous choices that Catholics are now making, Michelle did a brilliant job of showing how the language of autonomy and the value of autonomy are actually part of a larger cultural tradition in North America. Um, you could say that it exists in Western Europe as well, but just to stick with North America, there's a culture of autonomy. But there are other cultural values that often go along with that. Individualism would be one. Uh, another would be the intersection of individual freedom and autonomy with market capitalism. Uh, and then, sort of going off on another issue that's not quite as relevant to this, it's also the way science and reliance on science and technology are part of this same culture. So there, it's, it's not just autonomy in a vacuum, mm -hmm. it's a package of cultural values. And to me, the the issue is that Catholics are no longer participating in a pre-Vatican II or even Vatican II Catholic subculture. They're participating in other parts of the North American mix with other cultural values. And so sometimes I wonder whether um, framing this in terms of personal autonomy versus church authority is really the right way to frame the issues, or, or does it reflect kind of still a 60s or Vatican II mindset? Um, the language of autonomy, as you just showed, and as I just said, it is a part of the cultural mindset of North America and Western Europe, but not so much in Africa, Asia, or Latin America, where most of our new members are coming from. So you'd have more communal cultures. Um, Catholics in general, and this is happening, but happening more slowly with Hispanics, are becoming more mainstream in their education and income. Uh, so to the degree that the U.S. culture as individualist or consumerist, but also more economically insecure, is the culture of Catholics, then that's also going to influence the way they vote or the moral uh, decisions that they make. Um, in addition, I think another factor here is that people are feeling increasingly alienated from the older communities of neighborhood, church, ongoing workplace, civic associations, and political parties as they might have existed back in the 50s or even 60s or even 70s. Um, so that's just to put out there that issue of autonomy. And I'm going to, that, that's sort of a theme through some of my other comments. Not so much the autonomy, but rather what is influencing people. Um, so the second topic then is sex and gender, which is an area that I've done some publication and research on myself, although again, more from the theological perspective. But my question is, well, what are Catholic attitudes towards sex and gender and where do they come from? And when those of us who are more from the Vatican II era say Catholics are deciding for themselves and disagreeing with church authority, we think of issues like contraception in marriage, remarriage after divorce, and abortion to save the life of the mother. But in reality, what is our culture? It's not, you know, devoted married couples using contraception to space their children. We have a 50% divorce rate, we have a youth hookup culture, and we have a lot of abortions among young women um, who are not the victims of rape or incest. So according to the Alan Guttmacher Institute statistics for 2011, 22% uh, of all pregnancies end in abortion, and 18% uh, of women obtaining those abortions are teenagers, and women in their 20s account for more than half. So you have a 22% abortion rate, 60% are teenagers and women in their 20s. So what's going on with that? Okay, and whatever you may think about the legal necessity of an option for abortion, high abortion rates, especially when they're repeat abortions or when contraception is not used consistently, that's something we all need to look at. Okay. Um, so, Yes, there is a lot of disagreement with church authority. I think in many cases, just speaking from my own students and, and you know, other conversations that I've had, there, there is a, a lot of ignoring of Catholic teaching on sexual ethics. 
I agree with your findings. This is not just to be blamed on the nefarious influence of dissenters. Um, it has a lot to do with uh, loss of credibility after humanae vitae and also the sex abuse crisis, I think that's huge, uh, and the opposition to gay marriage, which is totally against the tide of current Catholic opinion. Um, I'm on the board of something called the Public Religion Research Institute, and they recently came out with a study that actually said almost three-quarters of Catholics uh, believe that there should be gay civil unions or gay marriage. Um, but I still think that um, what our target should be, so now I'm speaking more as a theologian or an educator, you know, the, the real task here is not so much to argue with the bishops over contraception or the immorality of abortion to save the life of the mother. It is to do a better job of evangelization, uh, evangelization around the traditional Catholic values of commitment in the area of sexuality and responsibility for children, or as Humane Vitae put it, responsible procreation. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean going back to exactly the same moral teachings. But how, I mean, I think young people or students here, for instance, are looking for a sense of direction, a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose. Many of them find John Paul II's theology of the body very uh, persuasive in that regard. So, you know, how are we replying to that? You know, what are the needs of the younger generation? Uh, who can speak to that? Where is meaning to be found? And sometimes, you know, the, well, the traditionalists say, just say no, and the dissenters are saying, don't pay any attention to the bishops. You know, and we're sort of arguing with each other on a spectrum of one to 10 in terms of one being liberal and 10 being conservative. We're all between nine and 10 fighting over contraception and marriage. But the, the younger generation, the millennials, have gone completely past that. And so they have a much more pluralistic, permissive sexual culture that they are trying to contend with that they're not really finding meaning in. And so we need to think what our answer is gonna to be to that. Okay, so um, moving on to my third issue then, which is, um, it's about what Catholics actually do compared to what they say, okay? Right. So, um, The surveys, in many cases, or I think most of your questions, were asking people what their values are. Um, but when I looked at some of the data, I started to wonder if what they said was really what they do. And this is also just coming out of my attempt to follow polling on religious behavior around political issues, which is your specialization, Craig, and you should be speaking to this, not me, but I'll put out there what uh, some of my ideas are. So, um, drawing from your surveys on spirituality and the generations, I had this question. If 100% of the highly committed Catholics say the sacraments and the Eucharist are important, but at most 54% of Catholics, so that's only in the cohort over 70, go to weekly mass, and when you get down to the, to the millennials, it's only 23%, then I don't get the impression that they really make Mass and the Eucharist a high priority. So they will identify something as a value in a survey, but they don't go out and do it. Um, another example, of course, again, important to me as someone who cares about Catholic social teaching, is the repeated refrain throughout the interpretive essays that Catholics place a high priority on helping the poor. And about the fifth time I read that, I went, really? Because Catholics, so first of all, just to start with the 208 election, 2008 election. Um, okay, so Obama carried the Catholic vote. And white Catholics voted for McCain, although men in greater numbers than women. So it was the Latino Catholics that carried the Catholic vote for Obama. And if I'm putting this together correctly, when uh, religious voters, including Catholics, were polled uh, after voting about why they voted or what, what were the most important issues, and this came out again in a Pew uh, survey in 2010 on political priorities, the priorities were the economy uh, and jobs. So people were not necessarily voting to help the poor, they were voting because they themselves and their families felt economically threatened, and they were looking for someone who they felt would give them a better economic shot than what was already happening. 
And I think that we have two distinct agendas there, which are both valid, but they're not the same thing. And the first agenda is to vote to improve your own economic situation and that of your family, which is very valid. I have five underemployed young adult children. None of them have health care uh, with their jobs. Okay, So that's very important. I'm not saying that that's not valid. But it's different than the preferential option for the poor, which is what we c keep harping on, but not what is driving voters. Okay, so this whole like thing of um, you know progressive Catholics trying to get the bishops to put more emphasis on uh, voting for the common good and the preferential option for the poor instead of on say you know uh, sex and gender politics, I worry that we're totally missing what the mass of Catholics out there are actually doing. And we're having this shouting match among ourselves, whereas voters in the population are in some other place that we're not dealing with. So I, I loved your surveys because they gave a lot more information. Sometimes I feel like what is going, a lot of times I feel, what is going on out there? Okay, um, so, so one is sort of Catholics and structural reform that helps the poor. Um, Secondly, of course, in your own data, you showed that um, only 60% uh, of Catholics, that is of even highly committed Catholics, say you, you can be a good Catholic. Well, I, should, I think I got that mixed up. Okay, 60% of highly committed Catholics say you can be a good Catholic and not help the poor. So that was sort of at odds with this big value on helping the poor. And then the final thing is Catholics are notorious for being terrible donors. Uh, so I, I was looking for some data and I was just looking on the internet and I came up with something that actually George Weigel, who's a conservative Catholic commentary, something he published in 2005. But, um, you know, he, he published an article surveying the giving rate among American Catholics and concludes they are among the worst givers in the country. Okay, so, so much for Catholics helping the poor. I, I, I'm not persuaded of that. Um, and then to move quickly on to the two more open-ended issues, uh, we're, you know, we're looking to the future and asking what we should do. So something that I spend a lot of time thinking about and interacting with my students, but especially our young graduate students. We have a doctoral program in theology and in theological ethics. And I've learned a lot from our doctoral students and their perspectives and, you know, their research. And so my question here is, what are younger Catholics looking for? So the millennial generation and younger, 45% of which are Hispanic. And I am not so familiar with the Hispanic population, but that will be addressed this afternoon. And um, the millennials and younger say, according to your uh, research, I, I don't think they're alone in this, but the reason that they value the mass is because of the liturgy, communion, and being with other people. And that fits into something else that I've really discerned as a phenomenon, but this is more anecdotal than you know, uh, validated statistics is that what young people are seeking in religious community and the church today is for, so they're reacting against their culture. They're looking for something that they can't find in the culture. They can find lots of sexual permissiveness. Okay, so they're, they're not looking for the church to provide a more liberal sexual ethic. They'll just ignore the church's sexual ethic if they disagree with it, unfortunately, sometimes. But what they're looking for is a sense of transcendence, that there really is a, a spiritual world or a, or a God out there that they can be in contact with. They're looking for spirituality, so a personal relationship to this God. They're looking for faith community that is coming together with other people to share faith and to be together and to worship. They're also looking, I think, in this communal experience for a sense of security. So they like structure, they like rituals. Um, and they also want a meaningful and structured personal way of life in this very fragmented, quickly moving, uh, permissive, not very stable and not very reliable North American economically challenged society that we're all facing. So if you look around at young people at BC, um, they're looking for a different message on the hookup culture. I taught a class last semester on 
uh, sort of on gender and theology, and so that was a huge interest of these, all of these students, most of whom were women. They are extremely attracted to traditional Catholic devotions, like devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, even the rosary. So many of them are wearing little miraculous medals like my grandmother used to have. I wouldn't be caught dead in one of those because to me it's like for a lady over 80. But there, there are these, these um, devotions and signs, outward symbols of being religious and belonging to this community that's structured, that's marked, that's distinctive. And then some of them, insofar as they are looking for a more structured and challenging and disciplined personal way of life, a, a, a minority are attracted to traditional Catholic sexual teachings, like John Paul II's Theology of the Body or a Natural Family Planning. Again, they're not doing it because the bishop said so or out of a sense of guilt or otherwise they might go to hell. They're doing it because they're looking for a religious and spiritual alternative to a very pluralistic, unstable culture in which anything seems to go. So um, uh, the question I have as we move forward is, um, how can we meet these needs that these young people have? Or who's going to meet the needs? That's the next question. I, mean, I don't know why I'm saying we, like I'm going to meet these needs. But, you know, how can Catholicism meet these needs and also do it in a way that is attentive to the worldwide Christian community? Because Catholics have gotten very congregationalist mm -hmm. in their dedication to, you know, Father Himes' Mass at B.C. or... Uh, you know, their own parish or, you know, all the young graduate students here go to St. Cecilia's, you know. I go to my parish church, uh, but if it were not meeting my needs, I would feel very free to go elsewhere. So how can we keep a sense of the worldwide Catholic community, not just Rome, but also the global church? And then in addition, of course, the common good Catholic social teaching and the preferential option for the poor, which is actually getting very short shrift, I think, in the majority of Catholics and their mentality. Okay, so the last thing then is Catholic education, because Catholic educational ventures might be one place where this reconfiguration and new evangelization could take place. And I think the worldwide network of Catholic universities is wonderful and is doing a fantastic job of modeling a different kind of Catholicism that allows for many different voices within it. Um, similarly, for international Catholic service organizations like Catholic Relief Services, the Jesuit Refu Refugee Service, uh, Caritas Internacionalis, um, so, you know, Worldwide Trocare, I think, is in Ireland. So there's a lot of different international Catholic organizations that are fantastic. I mean, they're the best of our Catholicism. There's a, a very deep spirituality that goes along with it, a biblical rooting, and an international outreach. But coming back just to Catholic education in North America, including not just the universities, but also elementary and um, high schools. So it seems from the data that Roman Catholic education did and still does help recent immigrants get an education and become assimilated into the mainstream, including making a higher income. Although with the data on income of Hispanics who go to Catholic schools, one thing that was in the back of my mind is whether they might also come from a higher family income mm -hmm. to begin with because Catholic schools charge tuition. Right. Uh, so if you can't get to that school or pay the tuition, then you know, you might not have that opportunity, although there are also many Catholic schools that have a lot of scholarships and low tuition. But I just, that was just in my mind. But what are, um, what are the other goals of Catholic education besides assimilation uh, into the mainstream of Catholic, or of U.S. culture? So something that I see as really coming out strongly in today's Catholic education that was not the case when I was in Catholic schools is the mission to serve the underserved, not necessarily Catholics. So if you look at the Cristo Rey, uh, chain is the wrong word, I guess, Cristo Rey network, you know, that is its explicit purpose, to offer education to students who otherwise wouldn't have a decent education, not limited to Catholics. Um, Boston College is supporting St. Columkill School here in uh, Brighton, 
And again, it serves the underserved. Passing on Catholic tradition is very important, but it's not the only role of that school. Um, so I think a new role is to serve the underserved, and uh, it's a question in my mind how much that's going to equate to passing on the faith to other Catholics, uh, because I don't know enough about the demographics of those schools or what they could be in the future. Okay. However, if we go back to the more traditional role, which is to form lifelong Catholics in the faith. So the first question I have is, by what standard do we know that they're really lifelong Catholics? And reading your data, I'm getting increasingly skeptical that we can say that weekly mass attendance, or even saying that they value weekly mass attendance, is going to be the right criterion. So I don't really know what it is. That's something we have to look at. Um, some possibilities would be, you know, a practical commitment to the common good and structural justice. I don't know how we measure that, maybe just by doing voting uh, data, I don't know. Uh, another one would, uh, would be, um, do they really exhibit an ethos of commitment and responsibility around sex, marriage, and family? You know, including perhaps gay unions and gay families. Uh, third, do they have a living sense of God in their lives, or what we sometimes call a spirituality? Uh, and then, um, uh, fourthly, do they participate in faith community, you know, in some sort of, uh, you know, organized religion more or less, okay? Um, the sense of community in the past, I think, often used to come from the immigrant enclave that the Catholics participated in. But to the extent that they're not participating in the immigrant enclave, then you have to ask what else is going to bolster that community. Uh, and in addition, we have this whole new phenomenon of Hispanic Catholicism that you, Michelle, and uh, Osman are going to speak to later this afternoon. And so that's a whole new situation which I'm not competent to address. Um, and the final thing with which I'll close and just open this to general conversation is um, I constantly have the question, who or what is going to provide Catholic identity and meet Catholic needs and community in the future? Is it Catholic education? Is it the Catholic parishes? Is it Catholic lay movements? Is it some new configuration? You know, what is really happening out there in terms of where Catholics are going? What are they doing? If they're affiliating in groups, where are those groups? And how are they related to the traditional axes of affiliation, which would be more uh, parish, Catholic organizations like Sodality or Knights of Columbus or something, you know, um, and then uh, education and universities and so on. So I leave this with admiration for all you put on the table. It was fascinating to me. If you have not picked up the NCR outside, I exhort everyone to do it. Um, and I just look forward to hearing what other people have to say or either of you or anybody. Yeah. Could I just make a comment before the question? I just want to thank uh, Dr. Cahill for all those wonderful comments and questions. And I basically don't disagree with anything that she said. Uh, but I think the answer to a lot of the questions you asked are, are actually in your first point. American autonomy absolutely does have a context. And I think that context is, as I said, individualism. But as you highlighted, this is a market capitalist society. And that's the answer to most of the problems. It, or, you know, without going beyond uh, data here, but, you know, Americans, particularly the non-Hispanic Americans, are core, this is what assimilation means, it means to fully embrace capitalism. That means I feather my own nest, it means that I vote my pocketbook, I can tell pollsters, yes, I value the poor or the lonely or whoever, but I vote a different way. Uh, and so I think a lot of that market capitalist analysis is totally appropriate, but then where does that leave us? And the, that other question is, you know, does, should we even not talk about religion anymore because the religion we see is so lukewarm and so f flexible about what people can do and can't do that maybe American religion, including American Catholicism, should just become like European Catholicism, basically dead. 
so that's sort of, I don't know, I guess that's a question for ethicists. Thank goodness I'm not an ethicist, because uh, these are very complicated questions. But I think you can't get away from market capitalism and its individualism. Uh, and secondly, I would say all this talk about the common good and the preferential option for the poor, which we all love that language, and the Cardinal Bernardine's consistent life ethic, that is just such beauty. But unfortunately, most Catholics don't know it, they don't articulate it, and indeed, I think in the political domain, the Catholic bishops, the Catholic Conference of Bishops, have not really been to the forefront, as we saw most recently with Obama's health care. So, you know, when we look to the public discourse and the public domain, there's not very inspiring, I think, for anyone, and certainly for young people, uh, Catholic leadership. So whether it's from the Catholic colleges, from people in the parish or the bishops, uh, it's hard to see good role models, I think. Uh, and then the one thing, Catholics are, as everyone, is looking for community. And unlike what Bowling alone argues, Americans are still joining lots of communal associations. They're not joining the PTA, but they're joining an environmental activist group or their local yoga group or whatever it is. But I don't see much effort in the Catholic parishes that I'm familiar with of reaching out and creating a more vibrant spiritual life for anyone in the pews, young or old or middle-aged. So, you know, and I don't know whose responsibility that is. It's our responsibility as Catholics in the pews, but I think also it's the responsibility of the bishops and the lay people and maybe of Catholic colleges to take, you know, a more proactive role in that because people are hungry. Later on this afternoon, I'll show some data on spirituality. Uh, but I don't see that they're getting their needs met within Catholicism. So if we're happy or willing to accept them, then that's fine. We can move on and, and measure, as you say, Catholic identity with some other indicators. I would uh, want to add uh, a couple of notes. One, uh, if you are not aware of um, uh, the book recently published by um, Dr. Dillon and her husband, Dr. Sink, in the course of a lifetime, it's a great way to understand the growth of autonomy uh, across all religious boundaries and non-religious boundaries. It's just, um, I think, a, a book that deserves much more attention. In the course of a lifetime, uh, what they did was to uh, study uh, some 360 uh, California teenagers back in 1930s and concluded an interview with them in the 1990s, wasn't it? Uh, late 1990s. Well, late 1990s. Uh, it's just an extraordinary book revealing to all of us uh, the strength of um, autonomy in American culture. I won't go beyond that, um, but uh, I'll do Michelle's work for her here. This is a, really a worthy. Well, thank important. you, Bill, but they, it's very, if I, but screw it, I think you all should read it because it followed them right through life, middle age, early adulthood, late adulthood. But the, the bad news is that they were Bill's generation. So they're the greatest generation and they didn't embrace market capitalism with the same and the conspicuous consumption and the consumerism. They're a different generation. They're now, uh, you know, in their 80s. Uh, it's the generations after World War II that we need to be worried about, as Lisa says, and the whole promiscuous and the consumption of today's culture. But yes, please read in the course of a lifetime. <laughs> or buy it at least, don't read it, just buy it. <laughs> there is another comment that I wish to make uh, to uh, Dr. Cahill. I just regret that I'm too old to take horses here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I would love to be in her, I just think yes. that's an experience yes. um, that uh, would be a rewarding one indeed. Uh, a third comment has to do with the fact that I am in Washington, D.C. I do take seriously the concern for the common good, the church's social teachings. Uh, I watch closely the degree to which the bishops do or do not emphasize um, the, this common good in a very practical and political way. And I have to say that they spend so much energy defeating the health care bill, I don't know if you would pay had paid attention, um, but the health care bill suffered from a November 5th or 9th um, amendment by Stupac, uh, forcing uh, the Congress to spend the next four months deciding whether or not uh, the health care bill without Stupac would be open to abortion, that by the time the Democratic Party was able to 
get enough votes together to pass the bill, it had been so demeaned nationally that an extraordinary percentage of senior Catholics voted against it and still are, uh, do not support it, do not even understand it. But the bishops had uh, given, and I'd have to say, the political enemies of this bill four months uh, in which to make this a negative bill. And uh, our survey this spring uh, shows that still a majority of Catholics uh, of whatever generation uh, oppose this bill. Uh, now that's not just uh, an accident. It is the way in which the Congress has worked. It is the priorities set by the bishops. I'm not trying to attack the bishops. I'm trying to explain because it's the only way that I can explain what happened with regard to this vote. I have been following all uh, votes, uh, roll call votes in Congress since 1959. And uh, the uh, book that uh, ends with the roll call vote of March 20th, at which point finally it was passed, seems to me to reflect the complexity of anybody really trying to do much to help the poor when political issues uh, uh, take precedence. Uh, um, it's a very complicated issue. Um, and I'm sure many people have uh, their own concerns about this, but uh, just if you take time to try to understand why it is that this bill is still so negatively perceived by seniors as much as by anybody else. In fact, they helped defeat the uh, Democratic Party. This isn't an attempt to um, justify any party. It's an attempt to understand exactly what's been going on uh, in this society and how difficult it is to change anything. Uh, certainly uh, to fulfill the uh, pledges of uh, the church. If you are interested in uh, trying to um, see what the church has to offer in the way of um, concerns for the common good, then I guess you have to uh, uh, watch the efforts of Catholic Network. Um, they, they work hard to uh, preserve whatever is left of the common good with a minimum of a political gain. Uh, but all right, I, but that's uh, enough of that. Uh, one final um, uh, item, uh, you raised the question of spirituality uh, Dr. K. Hill, uh, back in the 1990s when I was uh, working with uh, Father Bernard Lee on small Christian communities, Bernard insisted that when we began the work of interviewing people in small communities that I had to ask the question, what does spirituality mean to you? I thought it was an awful question. Uh, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. Bernard insisted I had to ask it. Now. I guess I never had thought, I, I avoided that word. It seemed a, a spongy word. Uh, nevertheless, in one of the earliest interviews I had, I was out in uh, Los Angeles uh, interviewing members of the Immaculate Heart community. Some of you know that um, after uh, Vatican II, uh, Cardinal McIntyre forced the uh, sisters of uh, the Immaculate Heart to uh, uh, either go back to their traditional clothing or leave the, their charter, lose their charter. Uh, they faced the abyss and uh, lost their charter but gained salvation. Um, <laughs> so I asked these uh, six, uh, you will know that the, one of the founding members just died within two, uh, last two weeks. She was one of the six who answered my question. I decided to say, well, okay, what does spirituality mean to you? And almost all of them said the same thing. Before Vatican II, it meant going to my room, uh, reading a, a passage, or saying the rosary, and then trying to reach up to God in some transcendental way. Since Vatican II and since our experience, spirituality has come to mean to me the way in which I treat my fellows in my community, the way in which I treat the people I work with, and the way in which I hope they treat me. Um, it is an attempt to reach out to them in love uh, in whatever I'm doing. Uh, that notion of spirituality has stayed with me. I haven't tried to objectify it. I think for, perhaps for the first time I have come to have some understanding of it.